Welcome to Power System Protection Lectures. My name is Pratap Mysore. Uh, today, this is the second lecture on the topic of transmission line protection. The very first lecture we covered about the parameters of a transmission line. A transmission line has guys a conductor. It could be overhead conductor or underground cable, and it has resistance and then inductance and capacitance. And then uh, we just went through uh, formulae for calculating this for an overhead transmission line and then uh, you know, how do we get this information from the transformer or sorry from the uh, tra transmission line uh, the wire manufacturers uh, similarly you can get information on the cable uh, cables also and then the cables are a little more complex but you do get this information on that the intent of the lecture was to just uh, make you aware uh, how you can verify the data that is furnished for you to do the settings on the transmission lines. <clears throat> Today, let's look at uh, what uh, types of uh, protection schemes are used to detect faults on a transmission line. I have a transmission line from uh, station A to station B. This could be a very short line of few kilometers or less than a kilometer, or it could be as long as 1000 kilometers as it is on an 1100 kV system. So yeah, now if you look at uh, the schemes that are used, the very first one we think of is just like what we did in bus protection, trying to compare current coming into the bus with the total current coming out of the bus. Some of these two currents must be equal to zero. So here we look at the current entering the transmission line at one end and compare it with the current that is leaving the transmission line at the other end. So here is stations A and B, we are trying to compare currents at both ends. Uh, it could be uh, individual phase currents or it could be a composite uh, current uh, which has got like M times IA plus N times IB plus P times IC. Uh, and then we can send only information about the composite current from one end to another end and then compare similar, uh, uh, compare uh, the currents at the remote end also with this. So essentially you are exchanging the information of the magnitude and phase angle of the current it could be either composite or it could be phase wise individual phase currents can also be checked on this so that is uh, the very first scheme so if there is a fault inside the transmission line it just opens lines uh, breakers a and b if the fault is outside then it uh, just says that it is an external fault just like a differential scheme uh, current based schemes uh, you have another way of detecting it they are called non-unit protections instead of exchanging information between two ends like a, a differential schemes here we look at the magnitude of the current that is going in if there is a short circuit the current increases you can make a decision based on that in an interconnected network you can look at the direction and magnitude of the phase current these are called directional over current uh, relays these could be used uh, and other option is to measure the impedance uh, at from from uh, as seen from I line end A or line B and B towards uh, the line section. It is a ratio of the voltage to current. If the fault occurs, the voltage goes down and current increases. So the impedance measure changes from load current to the um, uh, short circuit faulted current, faulted impedance, which could be the, just the impedance of the transmission line. <clears throat> so in the current base schemes, as I mentioned, they change, they exchange information from one end to another end. Various communication schemes are used. Uh, power line carrier is one of them where you exchange information on the transmission line itself. Or you could use a lease telephone line where you can, uh, if a telephone company provides you the telephone line, uh, telephone line from station A to st station B, and then you can send information on that. Or it could be a microwave communication, or it could be a fiber optic, it could be a ground, uh, and then the ground and you know, a shield wire can also have a fiber or you can have a separate fiber optic uh, from station A to station B. Or in the legacy systems, they used what are called pilot wire. They had an actual wire going from station A to station B and they exchanged very low currents uh, from station A to station B to make the decision. Here, the uh, thing is because you are depending on the information from the remote end, the reliability depends on the communication channel. If it is a bad system, then uh, you know, it is unreliable. Uh, if it is a highly reliable communication medium, then it is extremely reliable. The second option also is that it depends on the speed of communication of the channel. 
fiber optics, you know, is very fast. Uh, similarly, power line carrier is also very fast within three to five, four milliseconds. Uh, whereas the next one, if you take a least telephone line, it could be a cycle, 16 milliseconds for exchanging information from point A to point B. Now, current base games, uh, these I'll just touch upon this. The main focus of these lectures will be on the distance relaying, uh, which is the key point. The rest of them are all very simple uh, concepts, so you can get on it. When we come to distance relays, we'll try to understand uh, it is little more complex than uh, the other schemes. In the you know, pilot wire schemes, they have two types, opposed voltage types. They'll, uh, they generate voltage based on the currents at remote end, and then they look at it, how they are balanced, or it could be circulating current uh, principle that is used. And then, uh, as I mentioned, it could be composite current. It is a combination of all three phase currents, and only one current is sent from point A, uh, station A to the station B. And then station B also sends a similar type of information back to station A. Uh, phase comparison schemes is another way. Why should we worry about the magnitude of the current? Because whatever current that is entering a transmission line has to leave the, the transmission line. The only difference between these two currents is the charging current required to charge the capacitance of the line. Okay. So if you look at it, the, if you take current entering the transmission line as positive, the current, uh, the current which is leaving the other end uh, should be negative, which is uh, leaving the transmission end should be negative. So if you look at it, yeah, if it is uh, an external fault or a normal load condition, these uh, currents at end A and end B will be 180 degrees out of phase. So if we just look at the phase angle relationship, we can say that if there is an internal fault, the current from one end, which is from the leading end, which was sending power, will still remain the same. But the current at the receiving end, the current reverses, or if it is a radial line, the current becomes zero. So based on this information, you can make a decision. These are, these are called phase comparison schemes. And here also, we need a communication channel to exchange the information from point A to point B. The other one, which is becoming very common due to the uh, availability of fiber optics and a very reliable channel is the current differential schemes. Here, it is a very simple concept where you take the ratio of the two currents, you exchange information, phase currents, uh, information from uh, between the two stations, two ends of a transmission line, take the ratio of the current. If it is IA is the current sent from station A and IB is the current coming back from station B, you take that local current to remote end current ratio and plot it on a real versus imaginary axis of this particular ratio. This is called the alpha plane. So under normal condition, IB will be nothing but minus IA. If you take the ratio, it is one minus one zero on this particular point. Due to errors of the CT, due to communication errors, um, uh, 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 digital communication errors, you just uh, circle around this particular point and say that when the measured uh, ratio is lies within this, the relay is blocked. If it is outside, then you are allowed to trip. What happens if there is an internal fault? Uh, the B, IB current uh, reverses in, uh, in the angle. Uh, you know, it, uh, it, the current direction reverses. So this becomes positive. So it is staying in the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant in most of the cases. So if it is an external fault, then it is staying here, but the ratio of the two currents uh, will still be equal to one, uh, you know, as shown here, and it stays within this region. But due to errors, it might go outside uh, uh, you know, this region for, it might be so within this region, but it will not be on the horizontal axis. So let's look at the non-differential scheme, simple over current relays. Ampacity is the one uh, is determined by the type of the conductor. That is what we covered. For example, it is ACSR. It is 100 degrees C. The current um, that increases the absolute temperature to 100 degrees C is the limit. So if the current exceeds that, then we can put an inverse time over current relay or, or it's 150% of that value. If the current exceeds that number, then we can allow the over current relay to operate and open that particular breaker. And so this could be a three phase over current relays, so A phase, B phase, and C phase. And also you can measure IA plus IB plus IC, which is the neutral current or the ground current. And we can use four elements of over current relays. Uh, and if your fault current is always greater than the load current, 
then we can use the scheme. As I mentioned, it is a directional uh, region. If the fault current is always greater in that direction, flow of the power towards the line, and then we can use it. And uh, we, in, in an interconnected network, we can use ground over current relays um, uh, you know, very easily because under normal conditions, there is no ground over current. Its currents are balanced. IA plus IB plus IC will be equal to zero. Under fault conditions, ground involving ground, you get that current, and then we can make use of it and set the directionality to looking towards the line parameters. We will cover this a uh, little later in overcurrent relays. Other, uh, the only thing is it will be di uh, directional in this case in a transmission system in an interconnected network, whereas in the feeders, which is radial, it is non-directional. So if you look at it here, we mentioned in the very first lecture, our intent is to detect a fault only on the faulted section and isolate that faulted section. So now let us look at the system here. It is going a uh, transmission line. There is a transmission line from uh, station A to station B, and there is a transmission line from station B to station C, and there is another line beyond C, and there is one line behind A. So if there is a fault on the AB, uh, you know, at between B, section B uh, on the line section BC, then you want that overcurrent relay to operate first and isolate that particular line. And if that does not have, uh, operate, then the station uh, relay at station A provides a backup. So typically, directional relays are used in overcurrent uh, uh, relays in the case of interconnected network, or if the direction of the, uh, you know, so we are G, or if the fault current is, a flow is always in one direction, it need not be directional. So what we do here is, if there is a fault in section B and C, we try to operate at certain operating time because it is an inverse curve we are using. The higher the current, the faster the relay operates, uh, just because of the overload uh, um, criteria we are using. Now, if you take that, and then what we do is, if, say, if, if uh, our relay is operating in T uh, cycles for a fault on like, section BC, some say, say midline fault, then if that relay does not operate, you have to allow the station relay, relay at uh, station A to operate after a certain amount of time. What is this time? This is called a coordination interval time. Uh, this time allows the relay to operate and open a breaker. And then if there is a breaker failure there, wait for that breaker failure to operate. Otherwise, uh, uh, if, even if that fails, then this provides an ultimate backup. So this is uh, typically around uh, 20 cycles to 25 cycles. Um, and then it depends on the philosophy of the utilities. Uh, let's uh, go back to the next uh, 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 type of protection, non-unit protection, which we talked about. We said that it is going to be impedance-based relays. So to understand the impedance-based relays, let us look how we represent the impedance of a transmission system on what is called an impedance plane, which is an Rx diagram. X is a reactance and then uh, R is a resistance. So now if I take a simple uh, one line uh, here with a generation step up transformer and then a transmission line here between two station and then you have got a load. So we can represent whatever and then our relay location is at this particular bus. Let's say this is station A bus, which I have not mentioned it here, but we, from the previous uh, slides, we can say that it is station A. Now the transmission line has got resistance and reactance and as I mentioned, if it is a very short line, the capacitance is extremely negligible. So most of the cases, we can ignore this to understand the concept. So I have got a line resistance and then line reactance. And I have just shown that as a load. And then behind this, I call that as a source impedance, which has got a resistance, which includes the transmission lines or whatever transformer that is there and also the uh, uh, reactance and also the generator reactance. Uh, that is uh, Jx, I represent the total reactance as Jx source reactance, and then also it has got some resistance. I show that as source resistance. Now, if a current is flowing through that particular uh, section, the voltage drop across the uh, resistance is in phase with the current. So I can draw, uh, 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 I can show that on a diagram as IARL here. And now, now, the, similarly, the reactance, 
the current um, voltage drop across the reactants leads the current by 90 degrees. So I can show that as uh, Ij times I, um, uh, Xl. So now the impedance of the ZL of the line. So what is this? This is the voltage drop across the impedance of the line. If you look at this, the, if you, uh, the common uh, factor is this I. So if I take away I, this becomes the resistive axis R and this becomes the reactive axis. So essentially, this uh, line becomes the impedance of the uh, transmission line. So if I can, rep I can just uh, represent a transmission line from the point of measurement, this is uh, really looking from station A as RL and JXL or, um, or this is ZL of the transmission line. And now let's look at the load. Load is mostly resistive. How do you know that? Uh, loads are either resistive or it is 0.8 power factor leading or 0.8 power factor lagging. So if lagging is, uh, it has got an inductive component, so that point can be here or it, uh, somewhere here or it could be somewhere here. And then we can if we keep on loading the line, your impedance reduces. So you have got a region here, which is called the load region. When you go up and look at it here, and then if it's a transmission line impedance, it is falling in this uh, um, region. And then the theta L, the angle of a transmission line is very highly inductive. Since the transmission line is highly inductive, this angle is very close to 90 degrees. It could be 65, 75 to 90 degrees, uh, you know, 85 degrees or very close to 90 if it is an EHV system. Whereas in the case of transmission line uh, load, it is around zero and then it could be plus or minus 37 degrees based on this 0.8 power factor leading or lagging. So if you have an arc, so let us say that there was an arcing fault on the transmission line. Arc has been shown empirically, but that means through experiments that it is resistive in nature. And then they found that it exhibits a, a characteristics that it has got a constant voltage drop. If uh, the arcing distance is about uh, a foot, then the voltage drop across that is 440 volts, irrespective of the current flowing into that. This was the Westinghouse formula. This is a, an empirical formula. Similarly, uh, Warrington from the UK um, based uh, the, the experiments, he came up with another formula called, eight, uh, which says 8,750 times length of the arc in feet divided by I to the power of 1.4. So if you know the current, and if you know the length of the arc in feet at time t equals zero, it is given by H750 times uh, the length of the arc divided by a power four. And, but he also added certain formula to account for what happens to the arc when it is left alone like that. Arc tends to expand and increase based on your wind speed. So he added another correction here based on the clearing time. Suppose if uh, as soon as the fault occurs, if that relay does not trip the line, if it allows it to continue for a certain amount of time, the arc resistance increases based on this particular formula. So if you go back and assume that the arc uh, continues, uh, um, you know, just assume that there is an arcing fault from station A to station B, move from move the fault from the very close to the station A to station B. And then we know that it is dependent on the just the whole length of the arc. And then uh, if the current uh, close to the generating station is higher, current close to the remote end is lower because it adds the line impedance. You see that the arc resistance increases as you move towards the, uh, you move away from the station. So you get what is a trapezoidal uh, uh, region and we call this as a fault region. So now, we know that when there is a load measured from station from station A, impedance measured from station A when under normal condition falls in this region, load region. If a fault occurs on the line, it shifts from load region to the uh, fault region. So you you as uh, this is possible for us to differentiate because the angle of the impedance C measured by the relay is uh, mostly resistive if it is load or mostly inductive if it is a load region. So we can uh, characterize. So if we know if we can measure an impedance which lies within this uh, uh, fault region, then we can say that there is a fault on the line and trip the line. 
if it is outside this then we can say that it is low and we should not trip the line so there is a very clear demarcation and thanks to the line angle which is highly inductive we can make this uh, differentiation so now how do they, we do this if you look at uh, distance relay connections you have got the voltage which we use pts so to step down the voltage as we covered in instrument transformers and then the current also steps down the currents of 2000 or 3000 rated current to 5 amperes nominal when it is carrying full load current and then these two are fed into the distance element so now let's assume that uh, now let us see what is the relationship between the impedance of the line and what the relay sees now if you like the primary line impedance as zl as primary relays are connected to the secondary of the potential transformer and the ct so, so vz secondary what the relay measures is a ratio of voltage to current that secondary voltage to the secondary current the secondary voltage is nothing but the primary voltage divided by the ratio of the pt what you are using and then the secondary current is primary current divided by the ratio of the current transformer that you are using so if you rewrite this uh, equation what i get is z secondary is v primary divided by a primary times ct ratio divided by the pt ratio or the secondary impedance equals z primary times ctr by ptr so if i have 100 ohms uh, line as a primary impedance and the ct ratio is 2000 to 5 which is 400 and then um, i have got a 230 kv line which is 2000 so then uh, 2000 to 1 is the pt ratio so 2000 to 5 divided by 2000 to 1 it gives me 1 over 5 so if it is 100 ohms that is equivalent to a secondary impedance of 100 divided by 5 okay so now this is an example i have given for a 69 kv typical impedance is 0.7 ohms per mile 50 miles primary is 35 ct ratio 600 to 5 um, the same uh, equations we are going through this essentially if the relay measures 7 impedance 7 ohms impedance it is 100% of the line section with the, where the primary impedance is uh, 35 ohms this is extremely important for a relay engineer who is setting distance relays to understand what is the effect of changing the ct ratio on a transmission line okay if suppose if uh, it's a 500 to 5 uh, CT and then you want to go to 1000 to 5 then the impedance seen by the relay doubles because your CT ratio double Now distance relay characteristics is we know this is the fault region The best way to go back and then detect all the faults within that region is to use uh, quadrilateral characteristics, okay uh, And then other ways uh, you can also use a circular characteristics which detects only faults on line section a b or it can have a reactance delay or uh, you know these are the four uh, uh, rain then there is one more impedance delay which i have not shown here which is just a circular characteristics going all around here uh, this is missing in this uh, diagram so essentially it is that's a non-directional relay it operates if the measured impedance is less than the set value Relay design essentially compares the phase angle between voltages and uh, 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 phase angle between two voltage signals. Essentially, that is how it is done. And the relay design is analyzed in the next few slides considering three phase fault conditions. So, let us look at an example how uh, the relay is designed in uh, under uh, you know uh, using these principles. Uh, relay suppose is set to the uh, ZL setting on the relay. Relay operates and trips the breaker if the measured impedance is less than the line impedance. That is what we said. Voltage reduces and current increases. It shifts from load region to the fault region. Okay. Now let us take uh, three examples here. Uh, the protective line is AB. Impedance is ZL. And then uh, 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 you are looking at the relay setting at, uh, at uh, position A. There are three faults. One is outside the fault. Uh, outside the region second is inside uh, within the line section outside the line section inside the line section and third one is behind okay now what we are doing is the relay compares uh, it has got an impedance setting zl in the in the relay and it takes the current that is coming into the relay and looks and then uh, produces a voltage drop uh, izl just zl is the setting and i is the current going through that and then in compares uh, that with another signal which is the applied um, the measured voltage minus izl v minus izl 
So now let us assume that there is a constant current flowing and to understand this concept only. I'm telling that we are assuming the same current going through. Suppose if there is a fault at end B, then what will be the voltage drop across the line? V to I times ZL. So IZL must be equal to V here in this case, right? And if the fault is outside, the impedance uh, is higher than the set value. So the voltage drop, uh, uh, voltage uh, measured at the relay location is length of the line plus the additional line times the current that is higher. So V minus IZ and V will be in phase for an external fault. Please go through these slides to understand uh, then uh, just uh, to get a concept of how the distance is uh, uh, relays are, uh, are designed. So V minus IZ and Z, uh, IZL and V minus IZL are in phase because the voltage seen at the relay is greater than uh, uh, the voltage what it would have seen if the fault is at line B. So V if they are in phase, the relay blocks. Now let us take there is an internal fault. The current uh, is going through the relay. You measure it with uh, mul multiplied by certain impedance. Then I measure any uh, value which is less than that. That is the voltage uh, which, which the relay is seeing. But you have the same current going through a set value which is higher than this ZL2. So you get a higher voltage. V minus IZ and V, they, uh, their 180 degrees out of phase. So that is how it says that it is an internal fault. There is a fault within the line section AB. If there is a fault behind, the current is reversed. So V, my, v and V minus IZL are in phase, the relay opposes. So essentially, you are just measuring uh, a voltage at the relay point and comparing with the voltage drop uh, um, uh, across the impedance setting inside the relay of, uh, using that current. And then uh, if they are in phase, you block the relay if they are out of phase, then you trip the relay. So that is what you do in a phase angle comparator. V and V minus IZL are fed, and you set the angle as uh, alpha trip angle as 90 degrees. If the angle between these two exceeds 190 degrees, then you trip. If it is less than 90, you uh, block. Uh, what does it give you? If you have a 90 degrees angle, it is this. Uh, this is V minus IZ, IZ is this. This is the voltage. I'm just changing the angle of the voltage so that I get V minus IZ here. Normally, they will be uh, in phase or out of phase. If you have some arcing resistance, then it can be out of phase. So if you take this angle, this is a locus of a point which moves such that the angle subtended at the circumference is always 90 degrees. What is this? This is a geometric uh, property where uh, Z becomes the diameter of a, a circle and it is it has got a characteristic like this. Now, if you change the characteristic angle to 135, the, the Z becomes par a card, and then you get an elliptical characteristics. If it is equal to 60, it's less than 90, it becomes a tomato characteristics. This is how the relays are designed. I have tried to cover uh, these things in a very short period. Please do go through this again and understand the concepts of this. Essentially, what we need to get out of this lecture is that your secondary impedance, what you set on the relay, is based on the CT ratio and, uh, and the PT ratio. And the relationship between the relay measured impedance and the actual primary impedance is the primary impedance multiplied by the CT ratio divided by the PT ratio gives you the secondary impedance values. There are other characteristics here. Uh, then we also covered how we can, uh, how the relays are realized, how the relays are designed. This is just to give you a concept. In microprocessor-based relays also, you look at the uh, dot product or a cross pro dot product of these two, which is nothing but V times I times cosine of uh, the angle to determine whether they have uh, uh, the, that angle is within less than 90 or greater than 90. You have reactance relays. You're comparing Ix and, um, and a V and v my, Ix minus V, and that provides you the reactance relay. And Ohm relay is designed like this. These are various characteristics. This is just for your information. Uh, so the, this completes uh, lecture two. Hopefully you got uh, uh, the, to something out of uh, I know how uh, the relays are designed. That is what the intent of this was. We will cover about uh, uh, the actual uh, setting of the relays in the next uh, uh, lecture.